Thank you for joining us today for the Holocaust Center for Humanities Lunch and Learn program. I'm Alana Cohn Kennedy, the Holocaust Center's Director of Education. About two weeks ago, House Majority Whip James Clyburn said in an interview, this president and this attorney general seem to be doing everything they possibly can to impose Gestapo activities in local communities. His comment is comparing federal agents in Portland to the Gestapo. Last week, a couple in Minnesota wore masks with large swastikas on them to, protect, to protest the mask mandate. On Twitter, Gestapo is now a hashtag. On social media, people are comparing coronavirus quarantine to Anne Frank in hiding. There is so much to be learned from the Holocaust, but the misappropriation of symbols, terms, and images distorts and trivializes the history. The Holocaust has become shorthand for good versus evil, writes Dr. Edna Friedberg, a historian at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. As we move further away from the Holocaust in time, references to the Holocaust become more casual and through the internet spread with great speed. The images and comparisons are polarizing, leaving little to no room for discussion, and they simplify a complex history and the multi-layered issues they claim to represent. Quality Holocaust education has the power to challenge individuals to think more critically about these symbols, memes, and comparisons. Learning about the Holocaust encourages us to reflect on ourselves, our roles in society, and, as Dr. Friedberg writes, to wrestle with the world's moral failure. When we reduce it to a flattened morality tale, we forfeit the, cha the chance to learn from its horrific specificity. We lose sight of the ordinary human choices that made genocide possible. Providing quality Holocaust education is what our Holocaust Center does. For example, just before this program, we wrapped up the second day of our <clears throat> Advanced Powell Summer Institute. Offered online this summer, this year's program brings together some of the most dedicated educators in our region to learn and discuss and to plan how Holocaust education might look in their schools this next year. There are people alive for whom the Holocaust is part of their own personal experiences or part of their family history. It is not an abstract comparison. It is part of their everyday life. We owe it to them to take this history seriously, to not demean and trivialize their experiences. Today, we have the fortunate opportunity to hear from a person who was there and who survived because of the ingenuity of his mother and the generosity of individuals who risked their lives to save him. Peter Metzlar has been a part of the Holocaust Center Speakers Bureau for nearly 20 years, sharing his story with thousands of students and individuals throughout the country. P will take questions at the end of the program. Please type your questions anytime into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. And thank you so much, Pete, for being with us today to share your personal story. Okay, it should be there. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Looks good, Pete. We can hear you. Can you hear me? All yeah. Right. All right. Well, hi, everyone. So happy you could join us here today. What you're about to hear is my recollection of survival during the Holocaust. It's a shorter version of the normal due to the time constraint, constraint of the uh, Zoom. I was born in Amsterdam, the Netherlands in 1935. It wasn't until uh, 1993 at age 58, at which time I started to tell my story. I'm a very lucky guy in many ways. Married for 54 years to my B, to my wonderful wife B, who many of you know, having three great sons, Mark and Larry from a previous marriage, and Gary from B and me. One of the not so, not so lucky situations are, next please, is this particular slide that comes up from the Netherlands, where in fact, of the 140,000 people of the Jewish faith, 
by the end of the war, five years, short years later, between 75 and 80% were murdered. I consider myself quite lucky, to say the least, to be part of that 20%. We can speak of lucky and not so lucky. I even hate the word lucky, but next slide, what certainly was not lucky is the scar on the United States of 9-11, when 3,000 innocent people lost their lives. To put that into perspective relative to what Adolf Hitler did to the Jewish people, you take that horrible number of 3,000 and multiply it 2,000 times next. You come up with this incredible number of approximately 6 million people that were murdered, 6 million Jewish people by Adolf Hitler. Of that 6 million, incidentally, one and a half million were kids, 12 years and younger. Every, every country that Hitler occupied, they formed a thing called the Nuremberg Laws. There were a bunch of laws to demean, take away citizenship. There were many, many regulations relative only to the Jewish people. And in fact, it, uh, it served the purpose, it laid the groundwork, these laws, which later became the footprint for Adolf Eichmann, who was the engineer of the so-called final solution, how to annihilate every Jew from the face of Europe and the world. Going further as one of those laws, and we'll just talk about one of them, there's no time for all of them, and that is that every person of the Jewish faith had to wear a bright yellow star on their outer garment anytime that they stepped outside. Within that star, in the Hebraic style of lettering, it spelled the word Jew. In France, it would have been Juf, in German, Jude. In Holland, it was Jod. I have to jump, and by the way, it was not just the adults, it was kids down to the age of six that had to wear that particular star. And relative to, looking at those particular kids. Uh, you see this uh, kid right here in the middle? Yeah, with all the hair. Yeah, that's me, that's me. Those were the days, to say the least. Well, one of the things I wanna to do too is kind of jump ahead to the middle 80s when my mom was still alive, living in Southern California. And on a visit there, I found a box of old photographs. Amongst them was a picture of her in her early 20s uh, with that star. It, she is wearing that star in the coat. And when I flipped over that photograph, it had a crumbling piece of paper. And when I opened it, it had that star. I said, mom, where did you get that? She got very irritated. She says, I don't know, where did you get that? I said, it was in the picture. She says, I just ripped that off my coat at the end, at the end, of, the, end, end of the war. It was not a kind memory to say the least. If times ever after the virus become normal, I donated that picture and that star to the Holocaust Center for Humanity here in Seattle, and it is on display there. Mom and dad and I, we lived in a four story walk up apartment. And one of the first things that I recall, keep in mind, I was seven years old being awakened one night when trucks pulled up to the apartment complex, and I'll never forget these German soldiers yelling at the top of their lungs, alle Juden, raus, all Jews, get out. It was followed by doors being kicked in, babies screaming. I had no idea what it was all about. A lot of noise, they hadn't come to our door yet, but a bunch of my friends were missing the next day. I recall looking out the window and seeing people being rounded up by soldiers asking for identification, and many of them were put on trucks and hauled away. Heaven knows, where did they go? Nobody had any idea. In a period of six months, my entire family disappeared, were arrested. Mom tried to explain it. How do you explain that to a seven-year-old? The last person to be arrested was my dad. He used to like to fish. This was in June of 1942. The laws provided that a Jew could not go fishing. And he was arrested. And that is the last that we ever saw or heard of him again. 
as in many countries, there were people that said, this is wrong. People that came who stated, who are these Germans coming across our border? And they formed a very loosely net underground where they would, they would help people. One person in one block, two in another, very unorganized, help them get food, false identification, and more than anything else, would find people that would be willing to shelter and hide. My mom contacted one of those underground people. I don't know how she did that. That comes up several times in my story. I have no idea how she did that. And they came up with a middle-aged couple, Klaus and Rofina Post, on a little farm in the northeastern part of Holland. And when I said little, they had a couple of cows, a couple of pigs, a couple of chickens. That was it. They had a half an acre of ground that they raised veggies. And they shared everything with us. There was a Christian couple who had no idea what they were getting into if they did afterwards, afterwards when I got a little older. I was always amazed that they would share those hard, I mean, they worked their fingers to the bone in the field and the little, the little halves that they had and they shared it with two total strangers. And I mean strangers, they never heard of us. We never heard of them and they took us on and as i got older i realized not only what they shared with us but the mere fact that they took us in hiding because if for some reason mom and i were to get caught the germans would not put up with somebody given a do a hiding place both Klaus and rufina and their entire entire family would be shipped to a death camp no questions asked the raids became quite prevalent, even on the farm. They started to find out that Jews were being hidden on the farm. The trucks would come, they would ransack these farms like crazy. If they would find a person, they would put them on a truck. Again, they would be hauled to who knows where. The bottom of this farm, when I say bottom, the floor was a 12 inch knotty pine boards. And one day class did an interesting thing. He took a saw and cut in the joint of these two 12 foot wide boards and cut a hole right in the joint and when you opened it up foot and a half or two below was the dirt of this old farm and when i say old when mom and i got to that farm it was probably already 25 30 years old no indoor plumbing had like an outhouse for a toilet no uh, no electricity and so now when we heard the trucks coming up the dirt ro dirt road We'd open up those planks. Mom and I would jump underneath the floorboard. Klaus and Rufina would put the boards back on, throw a rug on it. And there were numerous times when the Germans came looking, ransacking, kicking over furniture. They'd be walking a foot and a half over my head. All it would have taken is one cough, one hiccup. It would have been it. That would have been the end of it. Klaus even felt that that was too dangerous. And next to the farm, only about 150 feet away, was a, a small a small group of trees, a little forest, if you want to call it, maybe a half an acre. And one day at dusk, he told me to get a wheelbarrow and some shovels. And I want to emphasize the word dusk. In the almost two and a half years we were on that farm, we could never come out during daylight hours. There were farms in the area, and like in every country, you got traders, you got enemy sympathizers. There were eyes, and we could not be discovered. Somebody would say, hey, who are they? Uh-uh, we had to understand, and this was hard. This was hard for a seven and a half year old. We had no body, we had no soul, we did not exist. Because just the acknowledgement of existence could mean the end, and could mean the end of life. So one day at dusk, <coughs> excuse me, we got the wheelbarrow, we went into this little forest and we got to a rise, we started to dig. After quite a number of hours, we ended up with a hole in the side of this little hill three feet wide, three feet tall, Klaus cut some trees out of the area, dragged them over, put them over the roof, interwove some twigs in front of the entrance. You could stand a few feet away. You'd never know there was anything there. Just blend in with nature. Now when the trucks came, mom and I would run out of the back of the farm and we'd crawl into this hole. Man, it was frightening. We would barely fit in, could hardly breathe in there, couldn't look out because of the twigs were two things that always really scared me that I remember, very frightening. Every time we crawled into this hole, dirt came trickling down. I was always afraid that it would cave in. But as I got a little bit older, of course, I even understood it at the time. 
I'm seven and a half year old. I don't understand what I'm doing in this hole. I don't understand it. And the thing that scared me more than anything else, I could hear them ransacking, carrying on on the farm, but I couldn't look out because of the twigs in front of the entrance. And the thing that scared me more than anything else, is it this time they're gonna come and get me? What did I do? Where's dad? Where's grandma? Where did everybody, what are we doing in this dirt hole here? Needless to say, I'm talking to you folks, they never did come into this, into this little forest. Mom and dad were, excuse me, mom and I were on this little farm. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, one of the things that I also want to interject was in the middle of, end of 1943, the Allies, the Americans and the British started to run bombing raids over to Germany, from Great Britain to Germany to wipe out Hitler's war machine. Next, please. And they flew B-17 Flying Fortresses. Those were four engine heavy bombers. It was just coincidental that we were underneath the flight path because when they came over in formation, six, seven, eight, nine hundred at a time, nine, the drone, the noise was deafening, absolutely deafening. They suffered a lot of losses and they started to run those raids at night. It was one of the first raids at night. I could hear them coming. The window shook, the ground shook, rattling of the doors. I got petrified. It was nighttime. I had to go to the bathroom, something fierce, but I certainly was too afraid to go out in the dark by myself with all this racket overhead. I asked mom to take me, which she did, and we stood in the dirt outside of the farm. The noise, the drone of those engines overhead were deafening. You looked up, of course, couldn't see anything. It was nighttime. Mom had a little flashlight. And just so I wouldn't trip over my own two feet, she turned on the flashlight. And then a strange thing happened. She turned that flashlight, and I hit her in the stomach with all my force. What was this all about? Well, it wasn't until, of course, I got a little older. In later life, mom and I talked about that. We laughed. It certainly wasn't funny at the time. What was that behavior? She was just trying to help me where I was going, turning on the light. Well, in the frightening mind of a seven and a half going on eight year old, when she turned on that light, I was convinced a bomb was going to come right that flashlight. You know, the crazy things that go on in your mind under the extreme, extreme pressure. Mom and I were on that farm for two and a half years. In her wisdom, because the raids became more frequent, she decided we need to find another place to hide. Because one of these days we're going to get caught. Not only would that be the end of us, but those dear, dear people, Klaus and Rufina and their entire family would be murdered. Even on the farm, she was able to get hold of one of those underground people. No idea how she did that. And they came up with a couple of women in the city of The Hague, seat of government in the Netherlands. And they had a three, four story walk up apartment to let us use one of the bedrooms. When we got there, I noticed it didn't take very long. It was very, very strange. And that was, they wouldn't share their food. They wouldn't share their stamps. Everybody had to have stamps to buy food, but of course the Jews weren't given any. And any time that there was any dirty work to be done, they asked mom to do it. We were hungry. There were times, a number of times, that mom disappeared for an hour or so. And she, at night, she'd come back with a loaf of bread. Don't ask. I don't know. I don't know where she got it. And like I say, any dirty work to be done, cleaning the floors, the bathroom, whatever, they'd ask mom to do it. And there was hardly any communication. There was such a warm exchange when, with Klaus and Rufina on the farm. They would hardly talk to us. It was, it was just so strange. But we had to be thankful. After all, you know, they did give us shelter. Uh, we were there for about six weeks and then mom came up with a word that I hadn't heard for a long time. And she says, Peter, <laughs> you haven't been to school. I said, what do you mean? I can't go to school. I'm one of them. I can't go to school. She says, well, I got some false identification for you if you ever get stopped. You're not Peter Metzlar anymore. You're now Peter Pelt. It was with that new last name, the star came off. 
and I went to a public school. One of the most frightening experiences that I recall, the reason being I was so indoctrinated of not being, of not who I was, what I was, and now I'm going into a public place. In my mind, again, what the mind does, I felt that every kid was pointing at me and say, hey, there he goes, there's one of them. They didn't know who I was. I was just one of the guys, you know, but it's just, you know, all that stuff that goes on in mind. At the end of the first quarter, semester, whatever it was, we got our, our grades. Needless to say, today the kids get their grades uh, on computer printouts, uh, no computers in those days, and it was a little booklet called a report book here. Uh, it is fading, but you can still see the name Peter Pelt on there. Never mind about the grades, forget it. Not very, very, very good. The next slide I want to show you, there was somebody in Germany, a bright young scientist by the name of Werner von Braun. Werner von Braun developed the first rocket for world, for war, you know, war purposes in the world. A missile, a ballistic missile. It was 65 feet tall. You see one being fired up there with a 2,000 pound explosive. They lined these up around the cities. They fired them at main ports, such as in Belgium, in Antwerp, in Holland, Rotterdam, and predominantly from the coast of Europe over to England, where the bombers came from. Many Brits got killed because the thing wasn't very accurate, but wherever it came down, it eradicated an entire city block. To the right is the picture of Herr Dr. Werner von Braun, with what I like to call the butchers in back of him, the hierarchy of the German military, because he had to join the Nazi party in order to get financing to develop, he and his scientists, to develop this uh, particular missile. Needless to say, the Brits weren't thrilled about these missiles. It killed many, many thousands of Brits. And so they started to come over and try to wipe out the launching facilities, of which many of them were around the cities. They tried to bomb them. They had fighters coming in, and there would be dogfights, all kinds of wreck going on. And one of the results of it all was you could walk on the street after one of these raids that could last from 15 minutes to 40 minutes, you could find pieces of shrapnel on the street. What is shrapnel? They're exploded pieces of ammunition, jagged, solid, solid steel, came from heavy duty caliber, you know, bullets, whatever, anti-aircraft fire. And here is a great story. Most of us here in the United States know the kids have something called trading cards. National Hockey League, the NFL, the NBA, you know, the kids trade the cards. Hey, I'll trade you ho, 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 fa, ha, 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 whatever. No such thing existed in Europe. Probably doesn't even know, but leave it to us crazy guys. And when I say crazy guys, I wouldn't even include the girls. They wouldn't be ridiculous enough to do this. And what was it? After those raids, you could find these pieces of shrapnel on the street, and the kids, the guys collected them. And we traded them in school the next day. Hey, Charlie, look at this big one. I'll trade you for that. Are you kidding me? Trading pieces of shrapnel. <laughs> well, it was on a Sunday afternoon. It was on a Sunday afternoon. Mom took the star off. We lived about a half a block where we were in hiding it with these women from a park. And she needed some air. And we took a walk over to the park. We no sooner get to the park and the air raid siren sounded, meaning the British on their way over, the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, would intercept, there'd be dogfights, there'd be all kinds of heck going on. Everybody ran into those smelly, stinky underground concrete bunkers. You could hear bomb, uh, bombs exploding, rat a tat of machine guns, it was frightening, but it was relatively safe down there. As I say, it could last from 15 minutes to 45 minutes, and when it was all over, we came out. And we, now this is on a Sunday afternoon. I remember holding mom's hand. And well, the crazy things to remember from all these days, I, I was wearing red, glo red gloves. I remember it had little knobbies on the inside. All the stupid things I remember, red gloves. It was on a Sunday afternoon, meaning school the next day. So I'm looking 
I'm looking for shrapnel to trade in school the next day. We walked for a few minutes and all of a sudden my eyes are drawn about 15 feet away to a piece of shrapnel the likes I had never seen before. It was like three times the size of those pieces that you see on the screen now. It was humongous. Oh my God, I'm gonna be a hero. I'm gonna be a big shot in school. Nobody would ever seen anything that big. You know, I had to have this sucker to take to school because <laughs> if somebody wanted to trade me for that, they'd have to give me everything they ever collected. I picked this thing up, it took two hands, it was heavy. And I do remember that heat, even though I was wearing gloves, heat came through my gloves. I was so proud, all I could think of, I'm gonna be a big shot in school tomorrow. I was so proud of it. I ran over to mom and I showed it to her and I don't know what took place in her mind. She takes one look at it, takes her hand underneath my hands, holding this thing and makes me heave it away. It wasn't five, six seconds later, there is an explosion. There is a small crater in the street. I have no idea what it was that I picked up, but whatever it was, it was live. My only regret was uh, I wasn't going to be a big shot in school the next day. I wouldn't be talking to you, to you here either. I mean, this was absolutely un, un, unbelievable. Now we go into an area whereby mom found out something unbelievably she found out that these women that gave us shelter were going to turn us in they got too afraid that we would get caught that would mean the end of them how mom found out i asked her i don't know how many times never got the answer so somehow she got again one of these underground people that found a one-room apartment back in amsterdam <clears throat> however amsterdam and the hague they're about 45 50 miles apart how do we get there there is no transportation. Couldn't even ride a bicycle in Holland, if you can imagine that. Those were the laws. It was strictly one highway that was used by the German military for troops and material. I wake up one night, I wake up one night, and mom is sewing what looked like a bunch of bed sheets. After a few hours, I look up at her and she made a skirt. She made a top with some buttons and she had a little hat with a red cross on it. I said, what are you doing? She says, get dressed. We got to get out of here. She made like a nurse's, a nurse's uniform. I had no idea. She bundled me up. It was winter time, bundled herself up and she put this contraption around herself and we tippy toe out of the apartment. We had no belongings. As we we're trudging through the snow, it was probably maybe 10, 15 minutes later. Now I'm 10 years old and all of a sudden, something comes to mind that says, mom, we're not going to that highway, are we? She said, Peter, we gotta get to Amsterdam. I said, we can't do that. I said, it's only for German military. Those are the guys that wanna murder us. She says, just be quiet. As daylight came about, I see these troops marching, flatbed trucks with tanks on them, artillery, and I am starting to get petrified, getting close to the highway, seeing all this might that would be potentially killing might walk by. And then mom does something as the expression goes, I know the doo-doo is gonna hit the fan. As we're standing along the side of the road with all this going by, she sticks out her arm, puts up her thumb, and starts to hitchhike. I said, Mom, what are you doing? I can't. She says, don't talk. It wasn't five minutes later, and a big flatbed truck stopped. A Nazi officer gets out, an SS officer. The SS, of course, were the worst of the worst. The black uniforms on their caps, they had a skull. They were the worst of the worst. And this officer gets out and starts to read mom the riot act. What are you doing here with the child? This is for the fatherland, no civilians allowed, blah, blah, blah. I have no idea why this guy would even give her a chance to explain what she's doing. And here was her story. She said, sir, you know about the British coming over and bombing the V2 rocket sites? Yeah, well, just a couple of days ago, one of the British bombs went astray 
hit the building, the kid here pointing at me was living. It killed his father and his mother. And as you can see, I'm a nurse for the International Red Cross, and I'm taking him to an orphanage in Amsterdam. The guy gave some strange look, at which time he grabbed mom by the arm. I'm hanging on to her for dear life. He walks over to these big flatbed trucks, and now he separates me from mom. I thought it was all over. I mean, she was my only security. He walks mom over to the cab of the truck, and he helps her in the truck, sitting next to the other SS officer, the driver. I'm standing by myself. As he is coming to me, I don't know what's going to happen. I am petrified. He picks me up and puts me in the truck in the snow. He walks back to the cab of the truck. Mom is sitting in the middle between the two SS officers. I'm sitting in the snow in the flatbed truck. Are you ready for this? And they, they took us to Amsterdam. I mean, come on. The guys that wanted to kill us took us where we, mom fooled them. The guys that wanted to kill us took us where we wanted to go. I get a little excited about this part. <clears throat> I just never, I mean, how did she come up with this convoluted plan? Absolutely unbelievable. Well, excuse me, once we got to Amsterdam in this little one room apartment, all that some of you may have been in Amsterdam, a beautiful old city with trees everywhere, but all the trees were cut down. People had no firewood. There was nothing to boil some water and dip a turnip into it and call it soup. There was hardly any food to be had, but, a couple of blocks from the little apartment that we had, there was an old high school that was taken over by the Nazis as one of their headquarters in Amsterdam. One day the British came over and leveled the place. The result being there was a block and a half of nothing but scrap, wood, bricks, you name it. Hundreds of people, me included, picking up these morsels of wood. I mean, that was like gold. I don't know how long we were on this, but all of a sudden, everybody gets up and runs away. Well, not everybody. I didn't see the people run away. Maybe I was working on a juicy two by four. I don't know. But I happened to look ahead and about 25 feet ahead. I noticed a lady that lived next door to us waving, run, go away. As she is running away, she's trying to make me run away. And I stand up and I no sooner stand up and I'm grabbed by the collar and I'm dangling on the, fist, on the fist of an SS officer. I mentioned I was never hungry on the farm. We always got fed well, but in The Hague, had to beg, borrow, and steal food. I was hungry all the time, undernourished, skinny legs, and here I'm dangling on the fist at the SS officer. He reaches in his belt, and he takes out a gun and puts it to my head, and he says, I will give you 10 seconds. Well, I wasn't about to ask what that meant. I mean, here's an adult with a scared little kid. Come on. He dropped me. He never shot. He didn't shoot me. But I can guarantee you those skinny little undernourished legs, I could have won the Olympic gold in the 100 to 200 to my. You, ne you never saw anybody running this fast in your life. The sad part about all of this was, the sad part was the lady that tried to wave me out of the way. The neighbor, she goes to mom, knocks on the door. Mom opens up and she says, Ellie, I'm so sorry. I don't know how to tell you this. I just witnessed it. They got Peter. Um, what that must have done to that woman. Here, losing the whole family. She just lived for me. And now to find out that I'm a goner. I mean, I can't imagine what that must have done. And I compounded the, <clears throat> excuse me, I compounded the problem. When this guy dropped me, I was too afraid to be followed. And instead of being back in five minutes, I went, I don't know, it took me 20 minutes, whatever. I was afraid to be followed. I went through people's backyards and alleys. And when I finally came to the apartment, mom opened the door and she was still hysterical, thinking that I was a goner. Well, I can tell you right now, I, I don't think I've ever been squeezed so hard in my life. When mom recognized that I was still alive. Anyway, it was in May of 1945 that the Canadians liberated Holland. The war was over. 
nobody in my family returned. It was quite a celebration. Mom and I, we survived in Holland, adjusting to so-called freedom, being normal for four more years. Mom knew somebody in New York, at the times the laws were different, who vowed, vowed for us and make a long story short, in 49, when I was 13 and a half, we left the Netherlands and we went to New York. We spent New in New York a number of months and then went came to Southern uh, to Southern California. In Southern California, during all these years, I never much talked about my experience. I want to go back to when I started out, and I said, not until 1992, when I was 58, did I start talking about the Holocaust. And it was because of the following events. My middle son, Larry, and his wife, Kristen, because of their job, they had to move to Brussels, Belgium. And we got a call from Larry saying, hey guys, why don't you come over during the holidays? I was so excited about that. I'd never been back to Holland over 50 years, still spoke the language just a little bit, but never been back. And the thing that was so exciting to me through all the years, I thought so many times, whatever happened to that little farm and those dear people, Klaus and Rufina. And then I got this sick feeling. I had no idea where this place was, what village. Mom was quite ill at the time. She didn't remember either. She came up with a word that I recognized as the dirt road, the Feineburen. Yeah, 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 the dirt road. But mom, I can't go to a foreign country and ask for a dirt road. That's all she remembered. I went to the, my library, looked at all these names. Nothing, there was one name, Makinha. Nah, not really. It didn't mean anything. This is all we had to go on. B and I, we flew to Europe to Brussels. We spent several days, maybe a week with Larry and Kristen in Brussels. Beautiful city. One of the things, by the way, in Belgium that I remember for those of that have been in Belgium, when you went into the underground, when you went into the, the subway, there were always little stands and they made waffles. Those Belgian waffles in Belgium were terrific. I remember that. <laughs> I remember that. Anyway, we spent a week in Belgium and then we headed out to the Netherlands. It was only about from Brussels to Amsterdam, you know, maybe a two and a half, three hour drive wasn't much. And when we got into the Netherlands, I got the biggest kick out of this. I was still able to read some of the, uh, you know, advertising signs. Uh, we became tourists, you know, we took the canal cruise and many people, beautiful canal cruise, where we passed the, the house where Rembrandt lived in. And we passed and later on went inside and visited the Anne Frank House, uh, the Rijks Museum, one of the world's most famous museum. It was just incredible. It was such a wonderful experience. And after a couple of days, we set out for this Makeha that really didn't mean anything to me. It was another hour and a half or so north of Amsterdam. <clears throat> and we saw this little sign off the highway, Makeha. Didn't mean it, even such, saw it spelled out didn't mean anything to me. And we drove into this quaint village and a couple of blocks down was a small bank. Remember the name, Robo Bank. And we stopped in there and my heart is pounding because I'm going to be so embarrassed. I have no idea where I'm at. The four of us went into the bank. A lady says, can I help you? I said, yeah, this is embarrassing. I said, we're, we're from America. I said, have you, <laughs> I'm so sorry. I said, have you ever heard of a dirt road called the Feinebühlen? And I'm ready to tuck my tail between my legs. She says, sir, absolutely. She says, it's about five minutes from here. I said, no. Oh, this was such a moving experience. The four of us, you know, Larry, Kristen, B, and, my, and, and myself, we were hugging, we we're crying. Not, you know, having found a place, we didn't even know where we were. In my case, stepping back into my history of over 50 years, we were making such a racket, the manager came out probably thought it was a holdup or something. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he told, told uh, Mr. Werner, what's his name, in the office. And we talked for a few minutes and then I had to ask a question. I said, did you ever by any chance hear or know the Klaus and Rufina Post family? He said, of course I did. I said, no. I said, how did you know them? He says, well, even before I became manager, they used to bank here. I knew, I knew them. 
I didn't expect any other answer after all these years, but yet when it came to this day, devastating. I said, what happened to them? He says, well, in the late 70s, early 80s, they both passed away. Not that I expected anything different. It just kills me every time I tell a story. You know, why didn't I go back sooner? Give them a hug. Thank you for saving my life. You know, regret is a horrible place, horrible thing to live with. Anyway, he drew a little map. He said, that farm is still there, probably bigger got in the car, we drove, and as we go up this dirt road, all of a sudden I'm looking over and I recognize the farm. Absolutely, I recognize it. It's gotten bigger, more barns, a lot of foliage, of course, after 50 years. I knocked on the door, I once, it turns out nobody was home. I was so disappointed for the simple reason. I wanted to go inside and go in that little room to see if those planks were still in the floor that mom hid underneath, mom and I hid underneath, but they weren't there. We walked around this farm for hours. When I got to the back of the farm, where at dusk I was able to come outside and play with some home, homemade toys. It was just the strangest feeling, so strange. I felt like I was seven years old again. I said it was winter time. It was pretty cold out. I said, I want to go into that little wooded area just to see if there's a soft spot in the ground where this cave, this hole in the ground that mom and I hid in many times was there. We go in there and for some reason we all split up. Every time I step on the soft part of the dirt, I you know, kind of talk to myself. I wonder if this is where it could have been. One, five, 10 minutes, whatever, and maybe 40 feet away, Larry calls out, Dad, come here, I found it. And oh my heavens, there was that cave like the day I left it. It didn't have the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, it didn't, didn't have the twigs in the front, but there it was. Unbelievable. After all these years that was still there. On the left, I had a little, <coughs> excuse me, little screwdriver on my keychain, and I carved mom and my initials in it. It was absolutely unbelievable. What an experience. That night we drove back to Brussels and something that I had talked about for many years and people said, what are you, some kind of a nut? I said, yeah, just ask B, she'll tell you. <laughs> and that was, I, if I had the opportunity, I wanted to visit the site of a Nazi concentration camp. And as we got back to Brussels a couple of days later, Larry made some arrangements. And we got on LOT, L-O-T, airlines, the uh, Polish national airline, and we flew to the city of Krakow, a beautiful, beautiful medieval city, uh, probably a thousand, a thousand years old. However, a 20, 25 minute drive outside of this beautiful, beautiful city was the largest, the most inhumane piece of hell that man ever produced for man called Auschwitz-Birkenau. You still see the railroad, rusting railroad tracks leading into the tunnel. The history books always show that building. It still has at one of the entrances, Arbeit macht frei, work sets you free. Yeah, right. The trains used to come from all over Europe. And when I say trains, they were cattle cars that normally would hold whatever, 50, 75 had a cattle they would have hundreds of people on there. And depending how long they were on the train from which country, so this is where some of them went to. It started to all add up, of course. This is, these trains, no food, no water, no toilet facilities. By the time they got to Auschwitz, many people had already died on there. Then I have to show this picture that I kind of interject, next picture. And there was this particular picture I found in the diary of Anne Frank when they went into details, and it actually has what you saw on top. Transportation of Dutch Jews from Westerbork to Auschwitz. Westerbork was a transit camp in the Netherlands. I remember, uh, you remember I was mentioned, the last individual to be seized by the Nazis in June of 1942 was my dad. I couldn't help but put that picture in. He might have been amongst us. The next picture shows what is called the area of selection. 
the area of selection, people were separated between old people and women with little kids and young people. The young people were sent directly to slave labor camps. Many of them never survived more than two, three weeks. You know, a square foot, a square inch piece of bread, a couple of sips of water, that was it. The other people, the old people and the ones with little kids were told a different story. You've been on a train, you got bugs on you, you've got a delouch you, you're gonna take a shower. They were led to an underground bunker and they were giving towels. No panic here, shower might sound pretty good after being torn away from family and their towns and villages. When they went inside, you could look up at the ceiling and there were shower heads, no panic here. And then they were told, everybody remove your clothes. Hang them up on the hooks on the wall. Remember the number where you hang your clothes. So after your shower, you can pick up your own clothes. When they were giving those instructions, the metal door shut behind them. Some panels opened up in the ceiling. There were some soldiers up there that emptied some canisters of a material called Zyklon B. Zyklon B was a cyanide pill. All hell broke loose people screaming, people coughing between one and a half and three minutes, depending on which gas chamber they were there. Another 500 to 1,000 people lay dead. As I say, those were the gas chambers. They were then hauled with meat hooks, some of the people probably from the slave labor camps, and taken to the crematoria. They were piled up 10 feet high, a block long, the amazing number between burning the bodies and gassing the bodies. There were days that they got rid of 4,000 people in a day. Unbelievable. It's beyond belief. I took a picture. I saw at the end of a railroad line, I saw a couple of lamps that usually indicates the end of the line. I took a picture of that. It was kind of a foggy day. And you can still see some of the gun towers along. It was part of the areas of selection. And I called it the end of the line. And I don't necessarily mean the end of the railroad line. In that one camp alone, in that one camp alone, they murdered, they annihilated almost one and a, and a quarter million people. That one camp alone. And I want to emphasize the Germans throughout Europe had thousands, thousands of camps for various purposes, slave labor, factory, you name it. But then there were a handful of camps that were just used for extermination. Some of you may have heard the names Dachau, Bergen-Belsen, Treblinka, Sobibor, Mauthausen, and of course the largest of them all, Auschwitz. Unbelievable. As we go beyond this, I want to put up a word called propaganda. It's information misleading to particular cause of view, you know, the particular cause or point of view. It is so important to me when I talk to youngsters in school to emphasize this propaganda because it is so effective so effective. There is a saying that some of you may have heard. We'll put it up on the screen here. And the saying is, if you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. This is absolutely so. And the reason I want to even substantiate that statement, Adolf Hitler appointed a minister of propaganda this is his picture, Joseph Goebbels, a minister in the government just for propaganda. And propaganda works if you don't research it, if you don't look at things. It absolutely, absolutely, absolutely works. On the next picture, I want to show something rather interesting. Remember, I mentioned this bright scientist, Werner von Braun. On the left here, you see him in his Nazi uniform. On the right is, was Werner von Braun and 500 of his scientists that came to America after the war. It was he who developed this massive, to this day, still the largest, most powerful rocket ever built 
the Saturn V rocket that propelled America's Apollo mission to the moon. It was first the killer, the guy that developed a killing machine, the V2 rocket. Now, of course, again, you can call that politics a big hero because in June of 1969, he was responsible for putting us up to move. We're getting to the end, folks, here. I know you've been most patient. One of the things that I want to emphasize, you know, there are people that say this thing, this Holocaust thing never happened. Really? It never happened. Oh, really? Well, let me say it does. Not because of this guy, not because of, you know, my particular experience, but this awful thing called the Holocaust in the history of the world is one of the most, and here is the important word, documented and recorded events, documented and recorded. Those deniers who are people that are very ignorant, they're bigots, they hate mongers, they're racist, they spread fear, untruth-based discarding facts. Well, they have their opinion. Well, that's fine but don't make an opinion of fact unless you can back it up, unless you can back it up with actualities. It was General Dwight Eisenhower, the engineer, the architect of the D-Day landing, who decided he wanted to go with the troops as they liberated some of these death camps because he wanted to see himself and document the appalling conditions. The most amazing thing about it is 75 plus years ago, he anticipated a time when Nazi atrocities might be denied. This was General Eisenhower, the 34th president of the United States. So let me just finish it all by saying this. I'm hoping for tolerance and independent thinking. This independent thinking is something that is so important. Too often we go along with the flow not always our own beliefs. During these challenging times, it is more important than ever to involve ourselves. So what can I say? I'm hoping in November, please exercise your right to vote because to stand by and do nothing is not an option. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you so much, Pete. Um, I, we have a couple of questions for you and we have only a few minutes, um, but one of them I want to ask, uh, pose to you comes from Martin and he writes, I don't know if you'll be comfortable answering this, um, but if you're willing, what type of, or if any, post-traumatic stress have you had to deal with throughout the years after having these experiences as a child? Interesting. I'm sure there are quite a number of them. I can cite you one, for example. And as a matter, just a couple of hours ago, <laughs> it reminded me. But when I'm sitting down, and if it is quiet, if I hear a car door slam, I jump out of my skin. And about an hour ago, one of the doors was open and the wind blew it shut. I mean, it was just a bang, nothing spectacular. I still jump out of my skin. I have to think. It is from those days. I keep telling myself, hey, the war is over, you know, but I'm sure there are many aspects like that left. V tells me I have night, uh, night terror sometime. I don't remember them. Maybe it's due to that, maybe not, but no doubt it has something to do with those days. We are getting so many really wonderful comments in the chat. We'll make sure you get to see them, but so many people are thanking you for sharing your personal story and for your um, words of wisdom that, that you've been sharing with us. I wanna pose one other question to you that um, comes from Gary and he writes, do you know if the plans to go into hiding were being coordinated prior to your father's arrest or were those plans initiated after he was taken away? It was afterwards that the realization came about, this hell is not gonna stop. We're gonna be next. It was not plan planned in advance. I, if I have one second, I would like to leave with a particular saying, it didn't come from me. And I'll tell you who it did come from. And the saying is, the world as we have created 
is a product of our thinking. It cannot be changed without changing our thinking. And that was stated by Albert Einstein. It was not my saying, but I think it has a lot of relevance. Thank you so much, Pete. I want to I want to actually close by reading you one of the comments that came in from Mary. And she writes, I saw Peter in person last year, and I am again enthralled by his story. As long as I live, I will cherish the fact that I was able to shake his hand. I will never forget the courage of his mother and, uh, and of him as well. Thank you so much for sharing your story. The world must never forget. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah. So I will. I, I hope we can end on that incredible note. Pete, you are a wonder. Thank you so, so much for sharing your personal experiences with us and for being part of our Lunch and Learn program today. You're very welcome. Thank you. Um, I want to thank all of our participants who joined in and who were listening. This program was recorded, so you'll be able to find it on our website starting tomorrow. Um, we couldn't offer programs like this one without your financial support. So if you are able, please consider making a donation on our website at holocaustcenterseattle.org. Just click the donate link in the top right corner of the homepage. Thank you. And if you are a student or if you know of a student in grades 7 through 11 and who is interested in making a difference in their community, please consider applying to be part of our student leadership board for the 2021 school year. This year, the program is going to be offered online, which gives us the new and wonderful opportunity to involve students throughout the entire state of Washington. So more information and applications are now available on our website. Also, please join us tomorrow for a book discussion of Destined to Witness, Growing Up Black in Nazi Germany. And you can find more information and sign up for this program on our website, it's tomorrow. I wanna give a very special thank you to Richard Green, our museum and technology director who is running the technical side of this show. And also a huge thank you to our executive director, Dee Simon and our entire team, Nicole Bella, Lori Warshall Cohen, our education team, Julia Thompson, Paul Regelbrug and Rosa Campos, our development team, Sydney Dreitel and Ellie Selesky, our Senior Operations and Engagement Officer, Amanda Davis, and our Administration Coordinator, Katie Lawrence. I hope you will be able to all join us next Tuesday at the same time for an important and time-sensitive program on the genocide of the Uyghurs in China, learn about the economic and political reasons at the heart of the crisis and the efforts to hold the government of China accountable for perpetrating genocide against this vulnerable Muslim minority population. I hope to see you all next week. Thank you for joining us today. And this concludes our program. Thank you again, Pete. Thank you.